my beloved brothers and sisters, this is an overwhelming situation. I was born in Salt Lake City, but I grew up in Thatcher, Arizona, a great and important city that few of you know about. <laughs> Many things happened in that little town. We went through the usual normal experiences. We had the 4th of July celebrations. We had contests. We had the school activities. We had everything that is available to a city of that size. It was a glorious life. Many wonderful young people were my companions. I was always proud of the town and happy to live there. And I lived there for some 45 years and then exchanged it for a house in Salt Lake City. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. I humbly come before you to say a few words. I will not give you any spectacular sermon, but I hope to call to your attention some of the things that disturb us, some of the problems that are before us. I make no apology, therefore, for discussing the subject which I have come to talk of. I've come not to entertain you. I'm here on a very serious mission. I desire to speak to you of matters which I feel are extremely important to you, to the people, to the world, to the church. The entertainer gives to the people that which they desire. The true leader gives to the people that which they should have. And like Paul, I am pressed in the spirit to warn and exhort and to strengthen. May I have the blessings of our Heavenly Father in my utterances. I realize that many of you are married. Some are contemplating marriage. All of you will likely be married in the next three or four years. In other talks, which I have given to the student body in previous assignments, I've warned the youth of Zion against the sins and vices so prevalent in our society, that of sexual impurity and all of its many ugly approaches. I've spoken of immodesty in dress and actions as one of the softening processes of Lucifer. I hereby express appreciation to the many who have carefully responded to those exhortations and re rewarn those who have ignored them. I spoke plainly warning youth of the pitfalls of petting and of all other perversions into which young men and young women sometimes fall. I endeavored also to give hope to those who might have stepped over the bounds of propriety, and I outlined to them the path by which total repentance might bring them to forgiveness. I have warned the youth against the many hazards of interfaith marriage, and with all the power I possessed, I warned young people to avoid the sorrows and disillusionments which come from marrying out of the church and the unhappy situations which almost invariably result when a believer marries an unbelieving spouse. I pointed out that the demands of the church upon its members in time, energy, and funds is great. The deepness of the spiritual ties which tighten after marriage and as the family comes. The antagonisms which naturally follow such mismating. That these and many other reasons 
argue eloquently for marriage within the church where husband and wife have common backgrounds, common ideals and standards, common beliefs, hopes and objectives, and above all, where marriage may be eternalized through the righteous entry into the Holy Temple. Today it is my hope to follow with a discussion of family life. This topic is not new, nor is it spectacular, but it is vital. Marriage is relevant in every life, and family life is the basis of our existence. The ugly dragon of divorce has entered into our social life. Little known to our grandparents, not even common among our parents, this cancer has come to be so common in our own day that nearly every home has been cursed by its destructive machinations. This is one of the principal tools of Satan to destroy faith through breaking up many happy homes and bringing frustration of life and distortion of thought. Honorable, happy, and successful marriage is surely the principal goal of every normal person. One who would purposely or neglectfully avoid its serious implications is not only subnormal, but is frustrating his own program. There are a few people who marry for spite, or marry for wealth, or marry on the rebound after having been jilted. How distorted is the thinking of such an one? Marriage is perhaps the most vital of all decisions and has the most far-reaching effects, for it has to do not only with immediate happiness, but eternal joys. It affects not only the two people involved, but their families, and particularly their children and their children's children down through the many generations. It's absolutely appalling the number of children today who are growing up in our society who have no, not, do not have two parents, a father and a mother, and neither one is totally sufficient if two could be had. In selecting a companion for life and for eternity, certainly the most careful planning and thinking and praying and fasting should be done to be sure that of all decisions, this one must not be wrong. In true marriage, there must be a union of minds as well as of hearts. Emotions must not wholly determine decisions, but the mind and the heart, strengthened by fasting and prayer and serious consideration, will give one a maximum chance of marital happiness. Marriage is not easy. It is not simple, as evidenced by the ever-mounting divorce rate. Exact figures astound us. The following ones come from Salt Lake County, which probably are somewhere near average. There were 832 marriage, marriages in a single month, and there were 414 divorces in our own communities. That's half as many divorces as marriages. There were 364 temple marriages. And of the temple marriages, about 10% were dissolved. This is substantially better than the average, but we're chagrined that there should be any divorces following a temple marriage. We're grateful that this one survey reveals that about 90% of the temple marriages hold fast. Because of this, we're re recommending that people marry those who are of the same racial background generally, 
and in somewhat the same economic and social and educational background. Some of those are not an absolute necessity, but preferred. And above all, the same religious background without question. And in spite of the most favorable meetings, the evil one still takes a monumental toll and is cause for many broken homes and frustrated lives. With all conditions as nearly ideal as possible, there are still people who terminate their marriage for the reason of incompatibility. We see so many shows and read so much fiction and come in contact with so many society scandals that the people in general come to think of marrying and giving in marriage, divorcing and remarrying is the norm. The divorce itself does not constitute the entire evil, but the very acceptance of divorce as a cure is also a serious sin of this generation. Because a program or a pattern is universally accepted is not evidence that it is right. Marriage never was easy. It may never be. It brings with it sacrifice, sharing, and a demand for great selflessness. Most of the TV screen shows and stories of fiction end with marriage. They lived happy ever after. And since nearly all of us have experienced divorce near to us, in our close friends and our relatives, we have come to realize that divorce is not a cure for, dif for difficulty, but is merely an escape and a weak one in that we have come to realize also that the mere performance of a ceremony does not bring happiness and successful marriage. Happiness does not come by pressing a button, as does the electric light. Happiness is a state of mind and comes from within. It must be earned. It cannot be purchased with money. It cannot be taken for nothing. Some think of happiness as a glamorous life of ease, luxury, and constant thrills. But true marriage is based on a happiness which is more than that, one which comes from giving, serving, sharing, sacrificing, and selflessness. Two people coming from different backgrounds soon learn after the ceremony is performed that stark reality must be faced. There's no there is no longer a life of fantasy or of make-believe. We must come out of the clouds and put our feet firmly on the earth. Responsibility must be assumed and new duties must be accepted. Some personal freedoms must be relinquished and many adjustments, unselfish adjustments, must be made in selflessness. One comes to realize very soon after the marriage that the spouse has weaknesses not previously revealed or discovered. The virtues which m were constantly magnified during courtship now grow relatively smaller, and the weaknesses which seemed so small and insignificant during the courtship now to grow, grow to sizable proportions. The house the hour has come for understanding hearts, for self-appraisal, and for good common sense, reasoning, and planning. The habits of years now show themselves. The spouse may be stingy or prodigal, lazy or industrious, devout or religious, may be kind or cooperative, or petulant and cross, demanding or giving, egotistical or self-effacing. The in-law problem comes closer into focus, and the relationship of the spouses then is again magnified. Often there is an unwillingness to settle down and to assume the heavy responsibilities that immediately are there. Economy is re reluctant to replace lavish living, and the young people seem often too eager to keep up with the Joneses, 
there's often an unwillingness to make the financial adjustments necessary. Young wives are often demanding that all the luxuries formerly enjoyed in their prosperous homes of their successful fathers be continued in their own home. Some of them are quite willing to help to earn that lavish living by continuing employment after marriage and they consequently leave the home where their duty lies to pursue professional or business pursuits, thus establishing an economy that becomes stabilized so that it becomes very difficult to yield toward the normal family life. And through both spouses working, competition rather than cooperation enters the family. Two weary workers return home with taut nerves, individual pride, increased independence, and then misunderstandings arise. Little frictions pyramid into monumental ones, and then frequently spouses sinfully return to new and old romances, and finally the inevitable breaks, break comes with a divorce, with its heartaches, bitternesses, ill disillusionments, and always scars. While marriage is difficult and sometimes discordant and frustrated marriages are common, yet real lasting happiness is possible and marriage can be more exultant ecstasy than the human mind can conceive. This is when the reach of every couple, every person, Soulmates is fiction and is an illusion. And while every young man and young woman will seek with all diligence and prayerfulness to find a mate with whom life can be most compatible and beautiful, yet it is certain that almost any good man and any good woman can have happiness and successful marriage if both are willing to pay the price. There's a never failing formula which will guarantee to every couple a happy and eternal marriage. But like all formulas, the principal ingredients must not be left out, nor reduced, nor limited. The, the selection before courting and the, then the continued courting after marriage process are equally important but not more important than the marriage itself, the success of which depends upon the two, the two individuals, not upon one, but upon two. Having completed a marriage based upon reasonable bases, as already mentioned, there are no combination of powers which can destroy any marriage except the power within either or both of the spouses themselves and they must assume the responsibility generally. Other people and agencies may influence for good or bad. Financial, social, political, and other situations may seem to have a bearing, but the marriage depends first and always on the two spouses who can always make their marriage successful and happy if they are determined, unselfish, and righteous. The formula is simple, the ingredients are few, though there are many amplifications of each. There must be the proper approach toward marriage, which contemplates the selection of a spouse who reaches as nearly as possible the pinnacle of perfection in all the matters which are of importance to the individual. And then those two parties must come to the altar in the temple realizing that they must work hard toward this successful joint living. There must be a great unselfishness, forgetting self and directing all of the family life and all pertaining thereunto to the good of the family. Subjugating self. There must be continued courting and expressions of affection, kindness, and consideration to keep alive and growing the love emotion. 
There must be a complete living of the commandments of the Lord as defined in the gospel of Jesus Christ. With these ingredients properly mixed and continually kept functioning, it is quite impossible for unhappiness to come, misunderstandings to continue, or breaks to occur. Divorce attorneys would need to transfer to other fields, and divorce courts would be padlocked. Two people approaching the marriage altar must realize that to attain the happy marriage which they hope for, they must know that marriage is not a legal coverall, but means sacrifice, sharing, a reduction of personal liberties even. It means long, hard economizing. It means children who bring with them financial burdens, service burdens, care and worry burdens, but also it means the deepest and sweetest emotions of all. Before marriage, each individual is quite free to go and come as he pleases, to organize and plan his life as it seems best, to make all decisions with self as the central point. Sweethearts should realize before they take the vows that each must accept literally and fully that the good of the little new family must always be superior to the good of either spouse. Each party must eliminate the I and the my and substitute therefore the we and our. And every decision must take into consideration that there are two or more affected by every decision. As she approaches major decisions now, the wife will be concerned as to the effect a given decision will have upon the parents, the children, the home, and their spiritual lives. His choice of occupation, his social life, his friends, his every interest must now be considered in the light that he is only a part of a family, that the totalness of the group must be considered. Every divorce is the result of selfishness, everyone I believe, on the part of one or the other or both parties to the marriage. It is nearly always selfishness on the part of two parties in varying quantities. Sometimes different. Someone is thinking of self-comforts, conveniences, freedoms, luxuries, ease. Sometimes this ceaseless pinpricking of an unhappy and discontented and selfish wife can finally add up to as much as a single serious physical violence. Sometimes men are goaded to the point they erringly feel justified in doing. Nothing, of course, justifies sin. Sometimes the wife feels herself neglected, mistreated, and ignored until she wrongly feels justified in adding to her errors. If each spouse submits self to frequent self-analysis and measures his own imperfection by the yardstick of perfection and the golden rule, and if each spouse sets about to correct self in every deviation found by such analysis, rather than to set about to correct the deviations in the other party, then transformation comes and happiness is the result. There are many Pharisaic people who marry who should memorize the parable of the Savior in Luke. People who prate their own virtues and pile up their own qualities of goodness and put them on the scales against the weaknesses of the spouse. They say, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I possess. For every friction there is a cause. And whenever there is unhappiness, each should search self to find the cause, or at least that portion of the cause, which originated in that self. A marriage may not be even an incident less, but it can be one of great peace. A couple may have poverty, illness, disappointment, failures, and even death in the family, 
but even these will not rob them of their peace. The marriage can be a successful one so long as the selflessness, so long as the selfishness does not enter in. Troubles and problems will draw parents together into unbreakable unions if there is a total unselfishness there. During the depression of the 30s, there was a definite drop in divorce, poverty, failures, disappointment. They tied parents together. Adversity can cement relationships which prosperity can destroy. The marriage that is based upon selfishness is almost certain to fail. The one who marries for wealth or for the one who marries for prestige or social plane is certain to be disappointed. The one who marries to satisfy vanity and pride, who marries to spite or to show up another person is fooling only himself. But the one who marries to give happiness as well as receive it, to give service as well as to receive it, and looking after the interests of the one of the two and then the family as it comes, there is good chance that marriage will be a happy one. Many people there are, though, who do not find divorce attorneys and do not end their marriages, but who have permitted their marriages to grow stale and weak and cheap. Spouses who have fallen from the throne of adoration and worship and who have fallen to the low state of mere joint occupancy of the home, joint sitters at the table, joint possessors of certain things which cannot be easily divided. These people are on the path that leads to trouble. These people will do well to re-evaluate, to renew their courting, to express their affections, to acknowledge kindnesses, to, and to increase their consideration. And their marriage again can become beautiful, sweet, and growing. Love is like a flower. And like the body, it needs constant feeding. The mortal body would soon be emaciated and die if there were not frequent feeding of vitamin foods. The tender flower would either die without, would, would wither and die without food and water. And so love also cannot be expected to last forever unless it is continually fed with the love potions. The manifestation of esteem and admiration, the expressions of gratitude, the consideration of unselfishness. Total unselfishness is sure to accomplish another factor in successful marriage. If one is forever seeking the interest, comforts, happiness of the other, the love found in courtship and cemented in marriage will grow into mighty proportions. Many couples permit their marriage to grow stale and their love to grow cold, like stale bread or stale jokes or a cold gravy. Certainly the foods most vital for love are consideration, kindness, thoughtfulness, concern, expression of affection, embraces, and appreciation, expressed admiration, pride, and companionship, confidence, faith, partnership, equality, and dependence. To be really happy in marriage, there must be a continuing faith observance of the commandments of the Lord. No one, single or married, was ever sublimely happy unless he was righteous. There are temporary satisfactions and camouflage situations for the moment, but permanent Total happiness can come only through cleanliness and worthiness. One who has a pattern of religious life with deep religious conviction can never be happy in an inactive life. The conscience will continue to afflict unless it has been seared, in which case the marriage is already in jeopardy. A stinging conscience can make life most unbearable. Inactivity is destructive to marriage especially where the parties are inactive in varying degrees. Religious differences are the most trying and among the most unsolvable of all differences. Marriage is ordained of God. It is not merely a social custom. 
Without proper and successful marriage, one will never be exalted. Listen to the words of your Lord. In the celestial glory there are three heavens or degrees, and in order to obtain them, the highest man must enter into this order of the priesthood, meaning the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. It's basic. It's a must. And if he does not, he cannot obtain it. He may enter into the other, but that is the end of his kingdom. He cannot have an increase. That's why I mention that it is proper and right to be married, and that is one is subnormal who does not wish to be married. We may hope and prom may be promises of, of conversions in when there is a member of the spouses who is not a member of the church, but certain surveys have indicated to us that about one out of seven joins the church finally that about six out of seven disappointments, which ends in the loss of faith often by the other spouse, and the children certainly suffer as they come along. That being true, the thoughtful and intelligent Latter-day Saint will plan carefully his life to be sure there are no impediments in the way. To make one serious mistake, one may place in the way obstacles, he may place in the way obstacles which may never be removed and which may block the way to eternal life and godhood, our ultimate destiny. If the two people love the Lord more than their own lives and then love each other more than their own lives, working together in total harmony with gospel program in their basic structure, they are sure to have the great happiness where a husband and a wife go together frequently to the holy temple, where they kneel in prayer together in their, and also in their home with their family, where they go hand in hand to their religious meetings, when they keep their lives wholly chaste, mentally and physically, so that their whole thoughts and desires and loves are all centered in the one, their companion, when they are both working together for the upbuilding of the kingdom of God, then happiness is at its pinnacle. Sometimes in marriage there are other cleavings, in spite of the fact that the Lord said, Thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart, and shalt cleave unto to her and none else. And this means as completely, Thou shalt love thy husband with all thy heart, and shall cleave unto him and none else. Frequently people continue to cleave unto their mothers and their fathers and their chums. Sometimes mothers will not relinquish the hold they have had upon their children, and husbands as well as wives return to their mothers and fathers for advice and counsel and to confide whereas Cleaving should be to the wife in most things, and all intimacy, intimacy should be kept in great secrecy and privacy. Couples do well to immediately find their own home, separate and apart from that of the in-laws or either side. The home may be very modest and unpretentious, but still it is an independent domicile. Your married life should begin, should become independent of her folks and his folks. You love them more than ever. You cherish their counsels. You appreciate their association. But you live your own lives, being governed in your decisions by your own prayerful considerations after you have received the counsel from those who desire to give it. To cleave does not mean merely to occupy the same home, but means to adhere closely, to stick so close. Wherefore it is lawful that he should have one wife, and they twain shall be flesh. This was spoken of to the bishop. And all this that the earth might answer the end of the creation, and that it might be filled with the measure of man according to his creation before the world was. 
Her own record is not pleasing. Of 31,037 marriages, our records say only 14,000 were in the temple for eternity. This was 46%, 7,556 in this year, that many spouses married out of the church. This is terribly disturbing to us. This was 24%, which means that about 9,000, or 30%, apparently, thought so little of themselves, their posterity, they married out of the temple, which could give them a possible key to eternal life. Is it possible they do not know, or do they not care? Of course, most such people who marry out of the church and temple do not weigh the matter. One, savory, one survey disclosed the fact that only about one out of seven would uh, be baptized and converted to the church. This is a great loss. It means that in many cases there's not only a loss of the unbaptized spouse, but also of the children and even sometimes the other spouse. We love those few who join the church after marriage. We praise them and honor them, but the odds are too much against us. According to the figures given above, this means that nearly 6,500 of the new unions may never find both parties to the marriage finally joining the church and making the family totally united. This grieves us very much. Even those spouses out of the church may be excellent, strong people, yet the total program of the Lord for the family cannot be followed through if the people are unequally yoked together. We call upon all youth to make such a serious, strong resolution to have a temple marriage that their determination will provide for them the rich promises of eternal marriage with the joys and happiness. This would please the Lord who counts on you so heavily. He has said that Eternal life can be had only through the way he has planned it. May I quote a word or two from the scripture before closing? And white, a white stone is given to each of those who come into the celestial kingdom, whereon is a new name written, which no man knoweth save he that receiveth it. The new name is the key word. And then in the celestial kingdom, celestial glory there are three heavens or degrees and in order to obtain the highest a man must enter into this order of the priesthood meaning the new and everlasting covenant and if he does not he cannot obtain it he, mu he can enter the other but that's the end of his kingdom again for behold i reveal unto you a new and everlasting covenant of marriage and if ye abide not that covenant, then ye are damned. And damned means stopped in progress. For no one can reje reject this covenant and be permitted to enter into my glory. These are the words of the Lord. They were said directly to us. There's no question, there's no fooling about them. And as pertaining to the new and everlasting covenant, it was instituted for a fullness of my glory. And he that receiveth a, a fullness thereof must and shall abide by the law. Therefore, when they are out of the world, after they have died, they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are appointed angels in heaven, which angels are ministering servants to minister to those who are worthy of a far more and an exceeding and an eternal weight of glory. For these angels did not abide my law, therefore they cannot be enlarged, but remain separately and singly without exaltation in their saved condition. 
to all eternity and from henceforth are not gods but are angels of gods forever and ever. And one closing thought that Abraham received all these things whatsoever he received by revelation and commandment by my word saith the Lord and he hath entered into his exaltation and sitteth upon his throne not future that is past this promise is yours also because ye are of Abraham go ye therefore and do the works of Abraham enter ye into my law and ye shall be saved brothers and sisters to conclude may I say this is the word of the Lord it's very very serious and there is nobody that can sit by and argue with the Lord. He made the earth, he made the people, he knows the conditions, he set the program, and we are not intelligent enough or smart enough to be able to argue him out of these important things. He knows what is right and true. We ask you to think of these things, all of you students who are going to marry. Be sure that the marriage is right. Be sure that your life is right. Be sure that your part of the marriage is carried forward properly. Now I ask the Lord to bless you. These things worry us considerably because there are so many of them and increasing. It has come to be a common thing to talk about divorce the minute there's a little crisscross, a little argument in the family. We talk about divorce and we already rush and see an attorney. This is not the way of the Lord. We go back and adjust our problems and make our marriage compatible and sweet and blessed. I pray the Lord will bless each one who faces this situation before marriage and after marriage. And I ask his blessings with my testimony that it's true and divine. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.